Anybody believing by faith today that the Lord is going to bring you out? Let's live it all over the sanctuary. There are some things.
me. He's able to deliver me. He's able. He's able. He's able to keep me. I said he's able to heal me. He's able to deliver me. He's able. He's able. He's able to keep me. He's able to heal me. He's able. Thank you for the invitation to come and to our colleagues in ministry who will share. We look forward to what God wants to share. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we honor you and we bless you. We thank you for this privilege to proclaim your word. We pray now for the enabling power of your Holy Spirit that will cause these moments of communication and proclamation to be rendered fruitful. May you receive the glory and honor from it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 22, chapter 23, beginning at verse 33, we find these words from the English Standard Version. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they cast lots to divide his garments. I want to talk tonight from this thought, let it go. Let it go. Our Savior has been taunted and as you know so well, has been grossly mistreated and manhandled, whipped, forced to go through kangaroo courts, trumped up charges, and now we find him beaten and bloodied and bludgeoned, nails in his hands. And to our amazement, the first words from his lips are words of forgiveness. The first words from his lips are a word of prayer to his father. And I want to suggest tonight that what he does to handle this miserable moment is insightful and instructive for us when we face similar injustices 
and painful circumstances in our lives. He teaches us, one, that we should pray. That when our back is against the wall, that if we can't do anything else, we can pray and call upon the name of our God. But there are some other things that he teaches us, and I'd like to try to share those in a very brief and, and prayerfully meaningful way. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. One of the questions that might be in some of our minds is, who is he referring to? Who, who is the them? I want to suggest tonight he's talking about Judas. He's talking about Peter, who would, who would deny him. He's talking about Pilate. He's talking about the crowd. He's talking about the soldiers. But I dare say he also is talking about you and me. The songwriter said, were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer is yes. We were there when our Lord was crucified. I love the words to the, this song. The look of love was on his face. Thorns were on his head. The blood was on his scarlet robe, stained a crimson red. Through his eyes, though his eyes were on the crowd that day, he looked ahead in time. For when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. We were on the mind of our Savior as he hung on the cross. And there are three things I'd like to suggest tonight that come out of these words from our master. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What is it that we should do when we find ourselves in a similar situation, find ourselves offended by other persons? He says, first of all, we should remit the iniquity. Remit the iniquity. In other words, we should pardon the iniquity. Three elements of the pardon. We pardon the offender. Jesus is pardoning the offender, the ones who are responsible, it seems, from an earthly standpoint for his being nailed to the cross. Not only does he pardon the offender, but he pardons the offense. And we need to take the time to pardon the offense. Some persons, unfortunately, we carry grudges around for years of offenses that persons have done to us. But the Lord is saying to us that we need to let it go. And letting it go means we need to pardon both the offender and the offense and then pardon the obligation. There's usually some consequence. There's usually some punishment that accompanies the offense. The Lord is saying we need to pardon the obligation as well and make up in our minds tonight you don't owe me a thing. That even though you set me up for failure and even though it set me back, you don't owe me a thing. God wants us to remit the iniquity because Jesus does that. Some of you are, are old enough to remember this, this song that says, I was guilty. Of all the charges, doomed and disgraced. But Jesus, with his special love, saved me by his grace. He pleaded and he pleaded. He pleaded my case. What he did was he dropped the charges and saved me by his grace. And while he was on the cross, he dropped the charges that all of us are guilty of. First thing he does is to remit the iniquity. That's what he teaches us to do when our back is against the wall as his. But secondly, he recognizes the ignorance. And sometimes that's, that's what we need to do is just, just recognize the ignorance of the individuals who, who are talking the smack, the individuals who are stabbing us in our back. Just recognize the ignorance. He recognizes the ignorant. He says, Father, forgive them because from my vantage point, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have a clue what they're doing. I want to suggest today that, that there are some sports analogies. One in the, in the football arena, I believe there's a penalty called unnecessary roughness. And when we look at Christ on the cross, we, we all can say that was just unnecessary. It was unnecessary to beat him with the cat of nine tails over and over again. It was unnecessary to pull the hair out of his face. It was unnecessary to put thorns upon his head. It was just unnecessary to put the nails in his feet and nails in his hands. It was unnecessary roughness. Somebody deserves a penalty. 
Then there's another penalty called a flagrant foul. Believe that's in basketball. It wasn't just that you fouled him, but it, but it was a flagrant foul. You, you really went way out of your way to try to do damage to the player with the ball. And then in the boxing arena, it's being hit below the belt. And what they did to my master was below the belt. What they did to humiliate him and to shame him, to murder him, was, was, was unnecessary roughness. It was a, a blow beneath the belt. And yet I hear him saying, as I've seen in football, I, I've seen him decline the penalty. That that's what he did. He, he declined the penalty. He had a right for the father to punish. But you've seen the, the, the game. You've seen when, when the penalty has been declined. Why is the penalty declined? Because the player knows that even though the offense was committed, the, the play put us in an advantageous position. And so, so, so even though we could take the penalty, we choose to decline it because we're in an advantageous position. And I want to suggest tonight that Jesus knew he was in an advantageous position. And not only was he in an advantageous position, but you and I were placed in an advantageous position. I believe that he would be able to say there while he hung on the cross that I don't want you to, to assess the penalty as you ought to because they are ignorant of the purpose behind my pain. That they're ignorant of the fact that I've been wounded for their transgressions. That I've been bruised for their iniquities. They are ignorant of the salvation beyond my suffering. We often sing wounded for me. Wounded for me, gone my transgressions because he was wounded for me. They are ignorant of the fact that, that, that the blood bleaches the sin. He, he wants us to know that what shall wash away my sin? Nothing but the precious blood of Jesus. He says they were ignorant of the blessing that was in my beating. I've stopped by to let them know that, that Jesus understood that they were ignorant of the healing that is beyond my hurt. For there is a balm in Gilead that heals the sin sick soul. He says, listen, that's the way we've got to treat people. Just recognize they're ignorant. They don't see the, 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 the ill intent that they have. God knows how to do something with it. He can cause all things to work together for the good of those who love God. So we've got to remit the iniquity. That's what he did. Recognize the ignorance. But as I take my seat, the third thing that I see he does is that we've got to reverse the intent. We've got the power to reverse the intent. That's what forgiveness really does. It reverses the intent of the enemy. You see, the intent was to destroy him. Destruction was the intent. Defeat was the intent. Death was the intent but i thank god that that evil that they intended jesus because he started out with forgiveness by the time it was over he had reversed the intent of their evil i'm mindful of felicia a friend of ours whose son was gunned down and as she went to the courthouse as he was about to be sentenced the judge asked her about her feelings and she spoke up and said i don't want to see the young man die i've already lost my son it doesn't make sense to lose two so instead of him losing his life he just received a few years yesterday some of you may have seen in the papers about belial who had the new around his neck in Iran and the mother of the son that he killed uh, plead what was begged that she would forgive him but she would not until the very last minute not only did she forgive him she helped to take the noose off of his neck that's what Jesus was doing when he said father forgive them he was taking the noose off of our neck i gotta close by telling you that when you reverse the intent of evil we take the death that was intended and turn it around for if you turn easy around you get l-i-d-e what was meant to kill you just gives 
life to you. I stop by to say we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living. No matter what men may say, do you know him tonight? Can you shout he lives? He lives. He lives. Let it go. Let it go. Amen. Protocol. Amen. Having already been established, I give honor to honor to whom honor is due to the Lord, our Savior, to the pastor of this house, my friend and my brother, Reverend Matthew Watley, and to you, my beloved, I greet you with Jesus' joy. There is a word from God that is found in Luke chapter number 23, verses 39 to 43. You find these words. It says, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise, mastering negative spaces. There is a black and white oil painting that hangs on a second floor wall in a museum in Madrid that is considered by many to be the most moving and powerful anti-war painting in history. Named Quarnica, it is created by Pablo Picasso in response to the bombing of a Spanish village sharing that name in 1937. Perhaps you'll look it up when you get a chance, and when you do, what you will find is a striking betrayal of the brutality and cruelty of war. The image itself is stunning, but what makes this particular painting a masterpiece is the artist's use of negative space. Negative space is the area around and between the main subject of the work. It is the area on the fringes of the painting, often left empty. It's the parts of the canvas not filled in with color. Negative space is the area most people pay no attention to. But what makes Picasso's painting so special is the way he uses emptiness within the frame to make a point. Uh, such is the case with this second word from the cross. I want to argue tonight that to fully appreciate it, we've got to pay attention to not only the main character, but also the negative space. That, that is to say that this second word from the cross is powerful not only for what Jesus says, but also for what he leaves unsaid. Uh, here, here before us, there are three conversations taking place. There are three crosses. Jesus is positioned in the center, and on each side of him hangs a criminal. In the Greek, they're called lestai, which is rendered in the English thieves, but really actually means bandits. One is repentant, and the other remains rebellious. As we read the text, we see a dialogue that takes place between the two criminals. We also recognize the climatic event, which is an exchange between Jesus and the repentant thief. But I want to suggest that there's also a conversation that takes place between Jesus and the unrepentant thief. Uh, but we've got to look closely because there's danger in overlooking the conversation. Uh, because though Jesus is party to it, he does not speak any words. It, it unfolds in the negative spaces. Uh, the unrepentant thief who hangs next to Jesus has a lot to say to Jesus. He, he has words of ridicule and slanderous words, but Jesus has no words for him. And can I tell somebody that there's a message in that? That just because somebody has words for you does not mean that you have a word for them? I, 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 I was always taught 
that polite company requires speaking to those who speak to you. But the longer I live, the more convinced I become that everyone who has something to say is not worthy of your response. Uh, some people, amen, are just plain ignorant. Others are misinformed. Some folks are just mean-spirited. Others just don't know any better. But, but whatever the case may be, you have limited breath, you have limited time, and you have limited words. And so the smart thing to do is just to take what you have and wait for something that comes important. Be, be clear that we've got together tonight for the seven last sayings of Christ. It is no coincidence that there are seven words. Seven is the perfect number. It represents the number of completion. There, there cannot be six words or eight words, but there must be seven words. No more and no less. When Jesus gets to his allotment of words, he'll be out of words. He's got to be circumspect and judicious with how he uses his words. In fact, he's only got six left because he's already used a word to speak forgiveness. He's still got some other messages to send. He's got to reserve a word for his mother and his beloved disciples. He's got a message to deliver to a Roman guard. He's got some stuff to say to his father. And so he has no words to waste on this man that means him no good. I wonder tonight how many opportunities that you and I have missed because we've wasted our limited resources on things that have no consequence. How many times have we just given away something that was precious and valuable to something or someone who was undeserving? Sometimes we lose focus on the things that should be priority in our life because we're consumed ourselves with issues that aren't worthy of our time. You do understand that the devil's job is to distract us from God's purpose in our life. And so if we get caught up worrying about things that have little significance or consequence, then we're just wasting our words. This unrepentant thief says to Jesus, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. He mocks Jesus, challenging his very identity and character. Some scholars argue that this criminal doesn't only, re only represent himself, but Jesus is all of his detractors. He represents the Roman officials and the uh, Jewish establishment. He represents the naysayers and the backstabbers, such that Jesus, even here on the cross, cannot escape the background noise of the crowd. And Jesus, though, is the master of negative spaces. He doesn't rebuke the man. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't challenge himself against the man's assumptions. He doesn't try to explain anything to the man. He does not say a word. That's because when you're comfortable with who you are, you don't have to waste your time with people's nonsense. Jesus knew who he was. He told his disciples that no one takes my life but I lay it down myself. He said to Peter I can call on my daddy right now and he'll send 12 legions of angels to deliver me. When your enemies rise up against you, you've got to know who you are. And while all of this stuff is going on, on the other side of Jesus is another thief. And he's been listening to this whole thing go down. Jesus had no words to spend in his own defense but the thief steps up and steps into the gap he says do you not even fear God we receive the due reward for our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong he speaks up on behalf of Jesus he says back up man you and I are getting what we deserve but this man has done nothing wrong see sometimes when you don't have words to defend yourself God will raise up somebody next to you to speak on your behalf. Uh, uh -huh. And this thief's defense of Jesus is all well and good. But I need you to see in this text that the most important words from this man are not the words he speaks in defense of Jesus, but the ones he offers in prayer to Jesus. He says, Lord, remember me when I come, when you come into your kingdom with the these words, the thief
thief becomes the first person to confirm that the cross is not a contradiction of his messiahship that Christ could in fact still be the savior and not save himself that dying on the cross would not prevent or preclude Jesus from raising up a kingdom of his own he says remember me when you come into your kingdom these words from the thief they shift our attention from the negative space where only has been silenced from Jesus to the positive space where Jesus begins to paint in the blank lines he says assuredly I say to you that today you'll be with me in paradise Jesus didn't have any words for the first thief but he's got a word for this man he says assuredly I say to you I don't know what anybody else has told you people may have lied to you in the past but assuredly I say to you you can rest assured you can trust in my words because I'm faithful to what I say the Lord had said through Isaiah the word that goes forward from my mouth shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing to which it is sent when the Lord speaks a promise over your life there is nothing that can stop what the Lord has already purposed to do there's no person that can block it there's no obstacle that can stop it because when the Lord says it it's as good as done he said assuredly I say to you he said today not tomorrow not next week not next year but today before the sun goes down before the moon comes up you'll be with me in paradise beloved it would have been enough for Jesus to send this man to paradise all by himself to relieve him of his suffering to set the joy of his salvation to have peace from his predicament but Jesus does not promise to send this man to paradise by himself he says today you'll be with me in paradise there's got to be somebody here today that can give God glory for the fact that he never leaves you alone the songwriter said that he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own I don't know about you today but I can give God glory that he's a God who sticks with me closer than a brother that his grace is sufficient for me is there somebody here that can give God glory for the fact that he sticks closer that even in the negative spaces that he was amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a thief like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see come on let's stand all over the sanctuary I want you to just take a couple seconds to think about how the Lord is moving in your individual lives. If somebody here doesn't know the Lord, I want you to trust that the God we serve, that the God we're talking about is real. So all over the sanctuary, I want you to just lift those hands and just bless God with us. And let's honor the Lord and lift this up. This familiar song just says, Lord, I lift my hands to you. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody, let's lift that. We say... Lord, I will Come on, sing it to Jesus. I to, the to the hills. Hill. Tell yourself, knowing then my help. from you. Say, 
you when we praise we wish you, you we... with Jesus joy on tonight thanking God our Father for this another opportunity to be in the land of the living and to be here at Kingdom Fellowship amen for the first time amen we're grateful to God for the senior pastor Pastor Matthew Watley and we thank God for this opportunity to stand amen very proud of my classmate amen the Word of God now comes from the Gospel of John, John's Gospel, chapter 19. We want to read in your hearing verses 25 through 27. John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. And it reads as follows, And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. For the next few minutes that are mine to share, I just want to talk about all in the family all in the family amen lord keep on doing what you're doing amen amen all in the family all in the family beloved the bible lets us know that jesus has a legitimate concern prior to going to uh meet his uh death in the grave for the family jesus has a concern for the family and this is very telling because before he dies he wants to make sure that his family is in order this concern expresses to us just how significant family is to Jesus in the scheme of things. And from the beginning, God gave humanity a perfect world to dwell in, a perfect garden to work in. But his crowning creation was to make male and female compatible units that they might inherit what God has created. Now we know that because of original sin, the initial family unit could not handle the responsibility put before them. But after the flood, it would be another family that would come on the scene. That's the family of Noah and the ark. And Noah's family would come and they would produce and develop and ultimately inherit what God had created for them to have dominion over. The point I'm trying to get you to see early in the message is that I want you to understand that all throughout history, God never did anything to make him leave the family behind. In other words, you're not supposed to leave your family behind. But we got a lot of people walking in manufactured favor where they are consumed by themselves so much so that favor is dripping like sauce all over their lives, but they ain't sharing no sauce with the family. I can't get no help in here. Amen. In fact, tell your neighbor, I came through dripping. Amen. I came through dripping. Amen. Y'all need to understand that the reality is when God gives you favor and God blesses your life, you're supposed to be a blessing to your family. The Bible says that you can't take your family for granted because if you do, you are worse than an infidel. 
See, God is not interested in just saving individuals, but God is interested in saving family units and groups of people that they might be the inheritors of what God wants them to have. See, God is not interested in just saving families, but God is interested in his nature being revealed through the dominion of the family. You see, there was Adam's family, and Adam sinned and messed up. There was Noah's family, and out of that family came Abraham's family. And out of Abraham's family, God told Abraham that he's going to be the father of the faithful. And Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Israel. And children of Israel made up the nation of Israel, and the nation of Israel gave God all kinds of trouble, but they were still family. See, the reality is, beloved, you ain't got a perfect family. And sometimes I know we wish we didn't have the people that we have. But you know what? You're stuck with who you got. You just need to go on and pray and thank God for the family that you got. Oh, they're not perfect. They don't line up the way they should. But the reality is they steal your kin. Amen. Touch your neighbor say, steal your kin. From all of these families, Christ then established the Christian family. You see, we are known as sons and daughters of God. Tell your neighbor all in the family, we are children of God. That's why this scene is so significant that Christ would stop dying long enough to be concerned about the family. And he had compassion, concern, and a connection to the dynamic of the family unit. It's all in the family. And beloved, real quick, I see my time is dwindling. That's why Jesus felt a responsibility to his mother. Jesus, looking down at the foot of the cross, sees Mary. And there were actually three Marys on the scene. Mary, Mary, Mary. Amen. Right there on the scene. The Bible says that one was Mary's sister. Now, scholars say that this was not Mary's sister, but probably her sister-in-law, because scholars say that Cleopas was the brother of Joseph. Just a little history for you right there. Amen. And, and so Mary was there, and, and Mary took in probably Jesus and all the children. Amen. When Joseph died off the scene. So Cleopas and Mary were there to be an aid to Mary and her children, amen, during their time of need. And, and can y'all see Jesus when he sees Mary, uh, the wife of Cleopas, and say, hey, auntie, amen. Says, hey, auntie, amen. Jesus was there. And, and, and what we see, beloved, is a responsibility because this Mary was like a second mother to Jesus. Mary Magdalene was there at the foot of the cross. She is spiritual family. But the one Mary that Jesus had responsibility for was his mother Mary as the eldest child. And Mary was the woman who was chosen and favored by God from the beginning. So Jesus in agony, Jesus bloodied and bruised, stops dying long enough to give life to his mother Mary. And that's why the enemy doesn't want your families to remain whole and together. That's why the enemy doesn't want y'all to stick by one another and work with each other. Because the reality is if families ever got a clue just how powerful you really are when you band together, there's nothing you can accomplish. There's nothing you can't do when you got family. When you got somebody patting you on the back and helping you through your situation, you got to praise God for your family. But the enemy will allow divorce to slip in and family crisis to slip in and wayward children to slip in and broken spirits and abandonment to slip in. All the works and plan to destroy the family. But Jesus stopped dying long enough to say, I got to take responsibility for mine so you take responsibility for yours. But then secondly, beloved, not only was Jesus uh, responsible for his mother, Jesus also gave a revelation about his mother. A revelation. Notice that Jesus addresses Mary as woman and not mama. He doesn't say mother because for a mother to see a child dying on the cross, it would have been made recalling the memories of childhood that much more agonizing to witness. So maybe Mary as mother would have been so distraught that she would have not had room in her heart for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus calls her woman out of respect. Jesus calls her woman, giving her the greater revelation in this relationship. You see, we have shared one level of relationship, mama. But I need you to understand what this means for the family, me dying on the cross. 
You see, if you hold on to me at this level, then you'll never know me at another level. And family likes to remember you as Pookie and Pookie Poo and, and Ray Ray Nim to be exact. But in order for me to go to another level, I need you to see me as Priscilla and Paul, not Pookie. In other words, excuse me, woman, I'm not going to call your mama because I need to take this relationship to another level. And in fact, beloved, the last time he called her woman was at the wedding feast of the Cana of Galilee. And he says, woman, what have I to do with this situation? And she said, whatever he tell you to do, you go on and do it. And Jesus did it and blessed the, the wedding party. The word woman also reminds her that at an early age, God chose her from the beginning to be the resource for Jesus when he needed it. Jesus is now dying on the cross. He is comforting her to recognize and realize I need to take this relationship to another level. I'm suffering on the cross so that I can help my family get better because I want all my family to be blessed. I want things to change so I want all my family to turn around. That's why third and finally Jesus establishes a new family relationship with his mother. He took time to say, woman, behold your son. But Jesus also said, John, behold your mother. And this is the same John who would write the revelation on Patmos. In fact, Jesus was okay with John taking care of his mother because John was the one disciple that was going to outlive everybody. And Jesus was okay with John taking care of his mother because Mary had something to offer him and he had something to offer Mary. Let me tell you something, young folk. You old people got something to offer you. Don't you spurn yourself at somebody just because they're a little older. You better open up your ears and listen to what they've got to say because they got a little mother wit and they got a little bit of wisdom on things in life. But you've got to understand that God wants you to have a symbiotic relationship. You've got to listen to them and they've got to listen to you you need to understand that all of us are a part of the family of God so this is not just an utterance from the cross from Mary and John alone but this is a directive for the church this is for Jacob and Sarah and Michael this is for Jerome and Leon and Shaquita this is for Ray Jane and Hector and Maria this is for Aramis and London and Imani these are for the people of God to let them know that we're all in the family and I want you to look down your row and just tell your neighbor neighbor you might not understand it I need you to understand hold the hand of your neighbor in fact and tell your neighbor neighbor you may not know me you may not even like me but we are family you may not want to be bothered with me but you can't get rid of me and you can't dismiss me and you can't hide from me because the fact of the matter is we are in the kingdom of God together and one of these days that's what the kingdom of God is going to look like we're going to be stronger wiser and better together tell somebody I can't make it without you hold their hand even if they don't want you to hold it and tell them we are family we're stronger in the Lord together somebody give God a praise say I'm glad to be a part of the family of God are you glad are you glad say it say it say it Praise the Lord. Come on, praise the Lord. Daddy, we thank you for all that we have experienced even thus far. And we surrender this moment to you now. Have thine own way in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. The fourth word, we're going to go to Luke 27, 45. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it, gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. 
Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. We're going to use as a focus for this time that is mine, a cry in the darkness. A cry, a cry in the darkness. Around this time last year, I was standing in the same place. Amen. With the same word. And it was as troubling to me then as it is now. Because if I can be transparent, for me, this is one of the more difficult statements that Jesus makes on the cross. It is one of the most troubling statements for me that Jesus makes on the cross. And for some to accept that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the savior, could have actually experienced suffering on a cross. For some, it was even scandalous. Because while now we wear crosses on our robes and we wear crosses on our necklaces and we have cross tattoos, back then, the cross was something to be shamed. The cross was something that no one wanted to be affiliated and or associated with. So to be crucified on the cross was for the thieves, was for the criminals, was for the dogs. It was not something that you would think that a savior of the world, that the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who came, amen, uh, for Jesus, the one who came from God, would be one who would be killed and to death on the cross. 1 yeah. Corinthians 1.23 says, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. It's troubling because there were even questions. Even now, some people are still questioning, looming about the relation of Jesus' human, human and divine natures. Trying to figure out whether or not Jesus Christ lost his divine nature because he was suffering on the cross. The question that I had to ask myself is, what is the significance of this cry in the darkness? What is the significance of this cry in the darkness for us today? Because one of the challenges I find with high holy days, and I shared this before, is that sometimes we can miss the significance of what is actually going on because we've gotten so caught up in the pomp, in the circumstance of the event and of the day. We're so used to celebrating the resurrection. We're so used to celebrating Good Friday. We're so used to it. Sometimes we can miss, and we need to find a place, here it is, to enter in so that we can fully experience. Because don't you know? that you can know something but not experience it for yourself I could know that Jesus died but not experience the meaning and the significance of his death for my own life I can know that he bled on the cross for my sins but not fully experience what that means in my own life so today we just want to look at the significance of his cry in the darkness so first we know that that a Bible reader that Jesus pulled this this word and I love it from Psalms 22 and 1 so he knew the word of God my God my God why has thou forsaken me and we understand that this cry that he made it is it is known that this cry that it, that was made was something that was of great emotional suffering so in other words when he cried he cried a loud cry and the word that was used to describe this cry was never used before in the new testament literally some theologians say he screamed it because it expressed his intense suffering, his intense agony that he was going through, not just for himself, but for me. So it was beyond us, but it is us. It was beyond me, but it is me. It was beyond me because it, it boggles my mind how God would do that, how he would come in as himself and then enter into the world and take upon the suffering of the world so that we would not have to die. He chose to die so that I don't have to die. And now he's on the cross experiencing the pain and the agony of what? Separation from his father. Listen, listen, listen. This darkness that he, that he experienced, literally the word says that darkness came upon the land and I believe this darkness was symbolic of what he was experiencing listen when he had to experience the weight of the sin now listen not just the weight of my sin but 
the weight of your sin. The weight of your cousin's sin. The weight of the sins of humanity. The weight of the sins of injustice from time to eternity were on him. And what does it mean when you sin? It means eternal separation from God. We are my Bible readers. It means that you are going to go into utter darkness. Because when you talk about hell in the Bible, they don't just talk about fire. They talk about utter darkness. So he was in utter darkness. And the significance of his darkness was that he was separated, not just for one hour, not just for two hours, not just for three hours. Timothy Keller helps us to understand in one of his writings that he, he, he said this, and I love it. He said, when you go to hell, you're just going to go to hell for a few hours. When you go to heaven, you're just going to go to heaven for a few hours because it's separation. So for that time, it was like infinite suffering but the significance of the infinite suffering was that it was connected to infinite love <laughs> Romans 5 6 and 8 says at just the right time and we were still powerless Christ died for the ungodly very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it was for me, it was for the judgment I make on others. It was for the pride we feel. It was for the unforgiveness that we harbor. It was for the envy that we have. It was for the jealousy that creeps in. It's for the illicit relationships. It's for the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh. It's for the gossip. It's for the murder. It's for the rape. It's for the me too. It's for the Black Lives Matter. It's for the abuse. It's for the racism. It's for the sexism. It was beyond me, but it was me. That, that's why I'd always, I always struggle with it because I can't read this without realizing that I played a part in the fact that he was hanging on the cross. I might shout, I might dance, I might be anointed, I might have the Holy Ghost, I might be able to preach until people fall on the floor, but I played a part in the reason that he's on the cross. how I enter in. That's how I get to Resurrection Sunday and realize that I can have my own resurrection because there is no resurrection without a death. And it's not just his death, it has to be my death. So time out for playing around, time out for, for being so worried about what we gonna wear and where the kids gonna go, what we gonna eat. Time out for that. Now is the time. For us to begin to consider what part did I play in putting Jesus on the cross? What part did I contribute? And then accept the love that God has for us. One of the challenges with sin is we get so scary we don't want to confess it. And the main person that we should be running to, we're running from because we think that we're going to get judgment. But because he was on the cross and because he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When I run to him, I find comfort and not condemnation. That when I run to him, I find an ally and not an angry God. Isaiah 53 says, surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many. One author reminded me that the ground is 
really leveled at the foot of the cross. So we all have a part to play in this experience. But as I go to take my seat, there was one other significant aspect of this that really spoke to my heart. And that was that not only did he have a cry, not only was it in the darkness, but he made the cry to God. So the relationship that he had still holds. So when I feel agony, I'm coming for you because you're looking like, I don't get it, I don't get it. If you've if you got a couple of months, got one more minute. His relationship held. In other words, even though he felt and experienced the agony that he experienced, he still held on to his relationship and he still followed through with what God called him to do. Don't you know that even when you feel agony, don't you know that even when you feel despair, don't you know that even when you're ready to throw in the towel, you better hold on to God's unchanging hand and understand the story is not over understand it's still being told understand God still got a plan for your life hold on it's time to receive our offering with this evening we're grateful to God that we have it to give amen as our uh, stewards and uh, ushers assemble themselves, uh, we're going to ask all those who are sharing with this worship experience online. I've been uh, seeing social media uh, pop up on my uh, feed, and I want to thank God for you coming and sharing this experience electronically. Worship is never complete without giving. Amen. One did not go to the temple empty handed. In fact, it was David who declared, what shall I render unto God for all of his many blessings, of his many benefits. And so even as you worship online, uh, giving is a vital part of worship. And so I pray that you will take advantage of our electronic means of giving. You may give uh, through our website, kingdom.global. You may give uh, through the Givelify app, or uh, if you are a millennial, you may give through Cash App, amen? Or your grandparent who has a millennial, amen, you have Cash App as well. That's how they have their money. And so we encourage you uh, by whatever means electronically you'd like to give, you may do so. Or if you'd like to give through uh, envelope, uh, their envelope have been made available to you. You may can make a check or uh, provide cash to those of you in the sanctuary that would like to give that way, and uh, we'll do that in just a minute. Uh, as you prepare to give, uh, we never we never ask that you would decide what you should give, but rather we challenge you to seek the face of God in your giving. Would you bow your head right now? Close your eyes. Use my words, but your faith. Repeat after me, Lord. I thank you for the standard of sacrifice that Good Friday represents God you didn't give some you didn't give most you gave your best and you gave your all therefore God as we move into this new season give us a new standard for giving to you remove the spirit of stinginess that we might walk forward in the spirit of abundance. So erase the amount we would choose to give right on our hearts that which you'd have us to sow. You say it, we'll give it because we know we can't beat you giving no matter how we try. Now speak, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now remember that God has placed in your heart. God has placed in your heart. I pray that you simply might be obedient to the Spirit of God. Let me say this as we move into this Easter uh, celebration. Uh, I don't believe you can move forward spiritually without moving forward giving financially. The Bible says where a person's treasure is, so their heart is also. You may interpret that to say that where my heart is, I will give. Or you may interpret that that where I give, my heart will follow. In either case, your giving is connected to your heart and where, and as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. So your heart is who you are and your heart is connected to your giving. And so if you really believe in God to do something new, I challenge you to start right now in giving a new manner to God. God bless you as you come. God bless you as you give. Our ushers are going to come and wait on us. You'll see uh, the baskets uh, come down the aisle. If you would simply make your deposit into the basket as we continue the ministry of giving. Our choir is going to come and minister in song. And as they're doing so, we're going to welcome the Reverend Nicole Massey Martin into the center seat. Amen. Who's the new kid on the block here at Kingdom Fellowship. She's going to run to the fifth word. And then we're going to have uh, Reverend S. and Tino Lewis, uh, the senior pastor of Clifton Park, to follow her with the sixth word. Come on, y'all. Since we in church, let's have church.
Aleluia. Clap those hands if you're grateful. If you're thankful, come on, let's enjoy the Lord together. Does that still work? Early in the morning. When the demons are trying to kill me. Hey, I'm covered by the blood. One more time, the blood still works. The blood still works. Yeah. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, God. Praise God for his tender mercies upon us thus far. The scripture reading for this portion of our time comes from John chapter 19, verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. I just want to share, stay thirsty, friends. Stay thirsty, friends. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you, God, for what you're doing right now. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. He had been hanging on the cross for several hours now, and Jesus was thirsty. He was more than just thirsty, he was dehydrated. Dehydration is what happens when your body loses more water than it takes in. And from the tears shed in the garden to the blood and water lost in the beatings to the sweat that dripped from his brow, Jesus' body had given out more than he could possibly take in. He was fully God and fully man, and in this moment, Jesus spoke of his thirst. On one hand, this statement comes as perhaps the most human statement of them all. I'm thirsty. The reality of his dehydrated body was so real that no one could deny that fact. His muscles began to cramp. His tongue was thick with lack of saliva. He could produce no more tears. The Savior was dehydrated. His physical thirst was so obvious that the soldiers tried to give him what they drank because they figured when you're really thirsty, anything will do. Yet on the other hand, this statement is also extraordinarily divine, Hinting at a thirst that goes deeper than flesh and reaching into the soul. Yes, Jesus was thirsty in so many critical ways. And the glorious invitation of this Good Friday is to draw near to this dehydrated Savior. Because if we are to be more like Jesus, we must learn how to live thirsty. To live thirsty is to live with a level of desperation and desire that only God can quench. To live thirsty is to live with an urgency for God's kingdom to come and for God's will to be done. To live thirsty is to live like Jesus. Because this statement on the cross teaches us that you cannot be a disciple of Christ and not have thirst. But I wonder sometimes, I wonder if maybe we've forgotten our thirst. Surrounded by creature comforts and lulled by our own religiosity, I wonder sometimes if we've lost our thirst. Like the soldiers who sat in the heat of the day drinking sour, cheap wine which made them thirstier. I wonder if we've taught ourselves to drink from fountains that don't satisfy. I wonder if we've sold ourselves into the rhetoric that urges you to obey your thirst all the while lulling us into this sugary, syrupy, sweet coma of sin. We've lost our thirst when the numbers of young adults who leave the faith don't affect us. We've lost our thirst when the pain of the world doesn't bother us. We've lost our thirst when the injustices of our nation don't make us sorrowful. We've lost our thirst when our own sins don't grieve us when God's word doesn't convict us, when songs of praise don't ignite us, and when God's presence doesn't move us. When I look at the world and when I look at our churches and when I look at my own life, I fear that maybe I've lost my thirst. Believers who aren't thirsty cease to be salt and light in the world. Churches who aren't thirsty can't bear witness to God's truth. 
Communities who aren't thirsty fail to show compassion to the vulnerable and needy. If we want to be more like Jesus, we've got to stay thirsty. So how, how can I, how can I stay thirsty? How can I become more like Christ in this significant way? Well, I think simply you can stay thirsty when you stay in touch with the dry places. Like Jesus, our dry places are both physical and spiritual. Sometimes the dry places are right where you live. You may be experiencing dry spells in your marriage, dry spells in your friendships, dry spells in your home or on your job. Sometimes the dry places are in your neighborhood, dry spells of youth needing mentors, dry spells of victims needing safety, dry spells of poverty and loss. Sometimes the dry spells are in the world around us, dry spells in urban cities and in foreign countries and even dry spells in the church. But most of the time, the dry places are within us. Dry spells in our prayer lives. The dry spells in our worship. Dry spells in our meditation and our reading of God's word. We face dry spells in our relationships with God. But rather than running from the dry places, Jesus calls us to run to those dry places. Because the thirsty Savior knows what it means to be dry. He knows what it means to have thirst. And Jesus allows us to thirst because sometimes our thirst is the only thing that causes us to run to him. <laughs> Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you want to be filled, you've got to stay thirsty. And if you want to stay thirsty, you've got to be in touch with the dry places. Don't allow your body, mind, or spirit to be satiated with cheap thrills. Refuse to let your soul be satisfied with cheap and sour wine. The devil wants you to believe that if you're thirsty, anything will do. But Jesus reminds us that your thirst is deep enough that only divine water will quench your thirst. Jesus knows what it's like to be dry. And he says, don't run from the dry places. Get in touch with them. And he proved it to us when he ran to the dry places by descending from heaven and being born on earth. He ran to the dry places when he hung around synagogues teaching truth to the wise. He didn't flee the dry places. He ran to them when he spoke to the women, when he healed the broken, and when he raised the dead. And because Jesus stayed in touch with the dry places, you and I can be touched by the only one who can quench our thirst. Jesus wants to fill us until our cups overflow. He wants to satisfy us until we thirst no more. He wants to lead us beside the still waters. He wants to restore our souls. He wants to fill us with living waters. He wants to give us eternal wells. But you can't be filled if you don't have thirst. So I say to you, stay thirsty, my friend. Friends. Stay thirsty for righteousness. Stay thirsty for his truth. Stay thirsty for God's word. Stay thirsty for his presence. Stay thirsty for salvation. Stay thirsty for his wisdom. Stay thirsty for Jesus. Because he who died promised that one day we will never thirst again. Stay thirsty. For it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never never lose its power father we give you thanks today for the sufficiency of the sacrifice of Jesus we thank you, God, for this high and holy holiday in the life of your bride, the church. God, we give you thanks for the anointing that's in this room. We give you thanks for the sacrifice of seven preachers. Pray, oh God, a prayer of thanks for those who are, for every waiting ear that's in the pew, to hear from you tonight. Father, we thank you for your spirit, which is in this place. 
So God, we just ask that you would do it again. We pray for the hand that we hold, Lord God. In fact, we squeeze our neighbor's hand right now. Whatever our neighbor stands in need of, God, we pray that you would do it right now in Jesus' name. And there's certain things that only you are able to do. Now, God, hide me behind your cross and under the drippings of your blood. Don't punish your people for the frailty of your preacher. Use me, but you get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Loose those hands. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise. For this is the day the Lord has made. And we should rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. It is finished. I want to preach. Watch what I say and watch what I do. It's Friday, April 3rd, AD 33. And it's the darkest day in human history. Though most humans have no idea of this, in Rome, Tiberius attends to the demanding business of empire. Throughout the inhabited world, babies are born, people are eating and drinking, folks are getting married and given, being given to marriage. People are bartering in the marketplace, Sh ships are Merchant ships are being sailed and battles are being fought. Children are playing and old women are gossiping. Men are standing around and lusting. People are dying. But today is the darkest day in human history. Because one death, one brutal, gruesome, horrific, Death, which will be the worst of all human deaths, will leave a stain on the canvas of human history. It's the darkest day in human history because in Jerusalem, God the Son, the creator of all that is, is being assassinated and executed. In order to understand how we got here, you have to almost do a flashback to a few days earlier with Jesus in Gethsemane's garden where he prayed and cried tears and called out to his father because of the assignment that was in his hands. And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus looks up and hears noises and all of a sudden torches are flashing in front of him. Hushed voices signal that there is an arrest party. Jesus wakes his sleepy friends who are jarred and alerted at the sight of their brother Judas betraying the master with a kiss. Soldiers encircle Jesus and Peter with anger in his heart pulls out his sword. It lunges at one of those who are part of the rest party that's nearest to Jesus. Malchus flinches, but he doesn't move far enough because he's in blinding pain. And blood surges to, his e where, to the place where his ear had been. Voices start to speak, but he can't hear them because all he hears is the sound of a screaming wound. He grabs it with both hands and he feels a hand touch his. And when he does, the pain starts to vanish. And under his hand now is an ear reattached to his face, stunned. He sees the master walking away. And, he's, and he has been encountered by the soon coming savior. Flashback to the Sanhedrin, the sun is breaking over Jerusalem, and now after the incident in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas swings by his own belt. Peter writhes with two emotions simultaneously, love and grief. Jesus', Jesus face is streaked with blood already, from having to endure the brutality of the police the night before. 
The council has made a verdict and they have said it is blasphemy. And now he has to go to the cross. And we find ourselves at this cross, morning wanes as darkness starts to fall away and the king is flanked on both sides by two thieves. But when I look at the cross, I don't just see the two thieves, I see you and me. When, 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 when I see the cross, I see those who are supposed to be judged hanging next to the master who knew no sin. Can you see this cross on Good Friday? Can you see the broken body of our Lord and Savior hanging before us? Can I talk about that for a second? That, that he is both divine and human and his body is hanging before us broken. It forces us today to wrestle with the idea that Jesus, if he is hanging on the cross, both divine and human, with a broken body, and we are made in the image and the likeness of God, that within us we have both brokenness and divinity. That when we see our brothers and sisters, we have a choice to look at them through the eyes of their brokenness. Or we can see the divinity that's on the inside of them. That he's hanging there on the cross and now, somebody say now, at the end of this journey, now after all that he's been through in the days leading up, to Good Friday and Holy Week. Now, he speaks this word found in John chapter number 19, verses number 25 through 30. Now, he says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Essentially, with, with one verse, John is saying that Jesus wants us to watch what he says and watch what he does. He says, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And these seem like penultimate words. They seem like they aren't uh, enough. We don't get enough from this one sentence in Scripture after all that Jesus has been through. But I want us just for a moment to take a look at these words with fresh eyes and see what Jesus might be trying to say to us in the year 2019. That when he says it is finished, he is no longer giving cries of a victim. Now he's giving cries of a victor. He's saying, watch what I say, but watch what I do. When Jesus says, it is finished, John the writer is simultaneously saying that Jesus wants to draw attention to two things, the audience that he is addressing and the assignment that he came to fulfill. Help me preach, Holy Ghost. That when you think about the audience that he addresses, it's hard to really understand where this word belongs in the trajectory of what he's already said. Because Jesus is clear about his audience that he's been addressing all throughout the text. In his first word, he addresses the Father. He says, forgive them for they know not what they do. In his second word, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. He's talking to the thief. In his third word, he says, woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. He's talking to the mother and to John. In the fourth word, he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's talking to God. In the fifth word, he says, I thirst. And all of a sudden, the centurion servant becomes his armor bearer and runs and gets him water and puts it on a, on a, a sponge of hyssop, Reverend Omari. In the seventh word, he's going to speak to his father again. But who's he talking to? In the sixth word, when he says, it is finished. 
I want to suggest that the text doesn't let us know explicitly who he's talking to, but I think there are a few options that we can surmise based upon faithful exegesis. Number one, he could be talking to himself when he said it is finished. Because every now and again, when your back is up against a cross and your enemy is in front of you, sometimes you need to speak over yourself and speak a word of life into yourself. Who am I talking to in here? Because you can testify with all you've been through in 2019 already that there's some times where you had to say, I'm not going to listen to the report of the world, but I will believe the report of the Lord. You ought to thank God that every now and again, God will refresh you and revive you and strengthen you because you preached to yourself. Who am I talking to in here? That some of your best sermons, some of your breast praise is not going to happen here in the sanctuary but it'll happen in your car it'll happen in your prayer closet it'll happen when you're at home it'll happen when you're talking to your family every now and again you got to speak over yourself when he says it is finished perhaps somebody say perhaps perhaps he's talking to himself but perhaps he's talking to his father Oh, come on here, somebody, because Jesus is a man on assignment, and God has told him what he was supposed to accomplish as by virtue of the incarnation. So if he says it is finished, it's Jesus going back to his boss to say, I did what you told me to do, that I fought to the finish, I ran my race, I kept the faith, and now it is finished. But there might be another crowd he's talking to. If he's not talking to himself, if he's not talking to his father, he may be talking to his haters. Because right there, you've got the crowd, you've got Caiaphas, you've got Pilate, and they're all the ones that put him on the cross. And they're expecting him to be weak. But he says, watch what I say. It is this finished. You ought to go ahead and give God glory right through there. He's saying it is finished, and that's what he has to say to us. But Jesus doesn't just want us to watch what he says, but watch the text closely. Don't miss it. He wants us to watch what he does. Y'all y'all see it in the text? John chapter 19, verse number 30, it says, Jesus says, it is finished, and watch it. And with that, what does he do? He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Y'all see that in the text? I looked at that text a couple times and I had to understand, I said, why would John include this little detail in this verse of scripture that we read every year? Why is it important for us to see that Jesus, after he says what he says, that he chooses, watch, to bow his head and to give up the spirit. I mean, why is that something that we need to see? And all of a sudden, in study, the spirit began to be, minister to me, Reverend Omari, and I saw that if he bowed his head after he spoke, then that must mean that while he was speaking all day, his head was held high, and even Even though they were crucifying him on the cross, Jesus knew how to handle his assignment and handle it with dignity. And can I talk to somebody in here? God is saying, I don't care what you're going through. When you recognize that you are a child of God and you walk by faith, you don't have to hang your head down low because what your circumstances don't define you. Help me, Holy Ghost. You ought to tell somebody, be careful about judging me based upon my circumstances because where Where you see me today is not where you'll see me tomorrow. Take a picture, save it to your iCloud. Go ahead and have a Polaroid and shake it. But I need you to understand I can hold my head up high and go through difficult times because God is with me. Oh, come on, shake somebody's hand and sow that word into them. Come on, say neighbor. Come on, be Baptist for four seconds and say my dear neighbor. I just came to tell you something. God is with you. God is with you. Come on, you didn't say like you mean it. Find somebody else. Shake their hand and say neighbor. Come on, be Baptist. Say my dear neighbor. 
Come on, say, God is with you. I don't know what you're going through, neighbor. Come on, so talk to your neighbor. I don't know what you're going through, neighbor, but I came to tell you, you got everything that you need to come out with the victory. Oh, I dare you to thank God in advance if you believe that thing. Come on, you ought to give him praise in advance because praise is an outgrowth of your faith. So if you believe it, then that means you're saying, God, I think you're up to something. I know things are crazy. That's what I see. But I walk by faith and not by sight. Oh, come on here, somebody. Give God the glory. Come on and give him glory. Can I tell you why? Because when Jesus says it's finished, it's finished for him on the cross until we get to Sunday. But while it's finished for him, it starts in us that where he ends it, his spirit is working in him to help him to finish his assignment. And so he's working in us to help us finish our assignment. And can I tell you something? God is not going to let you go until you're done with what God told you he wanted you to do. Go ahead and thank God because this is not a memorial service for you. But God said, I'm going to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. Watch it. According to the power. I'm almost through. I'm almost through that when he says it's finished, somebody say it's finished. It's hard for us to hear this word, it is finished in 2019, isn't it? Because everything around us tells us something different. It tells us that it can't be finished. God's work can't be completed already. Because when we look around and we see what's happening, it can't be finished. When a Tamir Rice can lose his life and gun violence can still be ripe, it can't be finished. When families are being separated at the border and mothers are being removed from their children, it can't be finished. When you can have a Nipsey Hussle who came to give it, give back to the community he came out of and that community turned on him, it can't be finished. Not with this much evil in the world, it can't be finished. But I came to tell somebody in here that God said that when I finished on the cross, it was an already not yet kind of finished. That I finished it all already but I came to keep moving through you I came to keep pressing through you he says that while it's done on the cross it's not yet fully done that I've got more work for you to do come on and shake another neighbor's hand and say neighbor I'm enlisted I'm enlisted that God's got me in the midst of his army that we've got a work to do we've got a battle to fight We've got a God to glorify. Oh, I wonder if there's somebody in here that believes that God's going to do a new thing in you. He's going to send you a new fresh wind because he's got a new assignment for you. Come on, somebody give God glory if you believe it. I'm through, Reed Tip. I'm through. But let me just give you this, that you got to understand some things about Christ's death, that Christ's death was natural, that when we see him, it was natural. It was four things. It was natural. His body died. He died on the cross. It was a natural death, that he was fully God, but he was also fully man. But the second thing that it was, it was an unnatural death, that for him to die in this way, it was abnormal. How could you murder the son of man. It's an abnormality that evil would want to even try to murder something that's so beautiful and good. It was an abnormal death, but it was also a preternatural death. Yeah, preacher, what does that mean? That means that his death was foretold before the beginning, that he knew it was going to happen, but it had to happen in order for him to accomplish something else. And somebody, you miss your shout cue because you're wondering why did I have to go through what I went through in order for me to be here today you thought that that was the end for you and it's been hard for you to get your faith back for you to get your swagger back for you to get your life back but can I tell you that it had to happen because now you came out of it and you're better than you were before it it was good that I was afflicted how many people here know that you're stronger now 
You're wiser now. You're better now. Slap somebody high five and say so much better. Oh, you ought to thank God for the prayers that he didn't answer. Thank God for the people he kept you away from. Thank God for the stuff that he kept you in. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. But can I give you the last thing? And it's this, that not only was Christ's death natural, not only was it unnatural, not only was it preternatural, but it was supernatural. Y'all don't hear me in here. Because it was, the Bible says, that while Jesus is hanging on the cross, and while he's standing there being derided by his enemies, while they're all mocking and abusing him, while they're stoning him, and they're going to put a spear in his side, the Bible says that he keeps on talking. Y'all don't hear me in here. He keeps on speaking. That's supernatural. Why is it supernatural? Because it tells me that he wasn't ready to die yet because he had enough life for him to go through what he was going through and keep on speaking. And I dare you to keep opening your mouth because what the devil wants to do is close your mouth because life and death is in the power of the tongue. He keeps on speaking because he still had strength. He still had power. He still had anointing. He keeps on speaking because he needed to sow words into us. He keeps on speaking because he needed to finish what God told him to finish. And I'm through. But you're saying, preacher, what does it mean when Jesus says that it's finished? Well, what it means is, is that he's accomplished everything. Somebody say everything. That Anselm's substitutionary atonement would cause us to accomplish. He's accomplished everything. Somebody say everything. That he's been the sacrifice. He's carried the cross. Oh, he stood up against his, against his haters. He's accomplished everything. Somebody say everything that was necessary for your and my salvation. You ought to thank God that you don't have to deal with the penalty, with the power, or with the pain of sin because he accomplished everything. Somebody say everything. He did it all and he did it for you and for me. Shake your neighbor's hand and say he did it for you and he did it for me. He accomplished everything. But I got one more question. That if he said it's finished and he didn't die yet, there's some stuff that was left that had to be done. He had to die for our sins in order for us to have salvation. So how in the world could it really be finished if he hasn't died yet? If the lamb hasn't been sacrificed yet? I'm glad you asked because every now and again, God has a way of declaring a thing before you get to a thing. Who am I talking to in here? You don't have to wait until the battle is over, but shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, come on, pull on them a little bit and say, oh my dear neighbor, you don't have to wait until the battle is over, but you can shout right now. Come on and give him glory. If you're shouting for your family, if you're shouting for your neighborhood, if you're shouting for your church. Have I got a witness in here? Jump up on your feet and give God a hand clap of praise. Oh, come on and give him a praise in this place. If you know that you know that you know that he is good, come on and thank God for the stuff you haven't seen yet. Thank God for the ways that he's making, for the doors that he's opening, for the provision that he's giving, for the way he's providing. Oh, come on and give God glory. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes in life, there are no happy endings. Sometimes the bad guys win and the good guys lose. Sometimes right decisions are met with wrong consequences. So sometimes the righteous suffer and seemingly the wretched are rewarded. Sometimes honest efforts are met with cynicism 
and suspicion and distrust. So sometimes we attempt to advance an institution or help a hurting individual or repair a relationship only to find ourselves with the fiercest resistance, resulting in us being insulted, assaulted, and assailed, all because we simply tried to do right by somebody. Even when we try to do the work, the will, and the way of God, we find ourselves as targets of Satan himself and his arrows that have been shot by the bows of man. Sometimes in life, there are no happy endings. And after 33 years of having been and always tempted, but knowing no sin, this seems like the worst ending to a life well lived. Jesus has now suffered, that the earth has rocked and reeled like a drunken man. The sun has refused to shine. And now that he has done everything, he speaks only one more word, found in Luke's gospel, the 23rd chapter, and the 46th verse, wherein he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And even though these seem like Ten ultimate words. These seem like words not enough to reflect the height and the depth and the breadth of a life so well lived. I want us to take another look at them, but because I believe that these are words that are benedictory and valedictory. That these words, in fact, are powerful and they are words of deliverance. But because I want you to hear what Jesus is saying and then hear the implication of what he's saying. When he says, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. He is simultaneously also saying, Father, I am now taking myself out of their hands. I, I thought it was deep. So I thought I'd share it with you. And the reason that I know I'm right about it is because I read a little sliver of scripture found in Luke's gospel, the ninth chapter, wherein Jesus declared that I will be handed over and betrayed by the hands of man. Which means that when Jesus was saying, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he was saying, for once and for all, I'm taking myself out of people's hands. And why don't you go ahead and help me announce my title, touch somebody, just tell them, take yourself out of their hands. Because the truth is, my beloved brothers and sisters, when you find yourself living to the standard of people, you are living in other people's hands. When you find yourself unable to feel good about yourself without the acceptance, the applause, the acclaim, and the approval of somebody else, then you are living in somebody else's hands. And that's what Jesus teaches us in this final word that he speaks from the cross. Jesus says, I've lived in their hands too long. It's because I was in their hands that I found myself disappointed last night when I asked my inner circle to intervene for me in intercessory prayer and I found them asleep on the job. I was disappointed because I prayed and hoped that somebody else would pray for me. Can I tell you something? If you live in the place of spiritual codependence, when you're looking for somebody else to get you in God, you're going to be disappointed every time. Jesus was disappointed because he had asked them to pray and put himself in their hands. He was, he, he was hurt because one of his inner circle, one of the 12, had chosen to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. He was sold out by the hands of Judas. And, and then the Bible says that they took him from one kangaroo court to another, and then he found his fate held in the hands of people who wanted to remind you just a few 
days ago had palms in their hands lifting them above their head crying out Hosanna but now these same Negroes are balling up their fist in Jesus face and declaring let the rabbits go and crucify Jesus I need some Bible readers the Bible says that Jesus has been in their hands now we're before Pilate and Pilate seeks to obfuscate his responsibility by trying to wash his hands of the situation but understand anytime you deny the opportunity to stand for integrity you may be relieved in the eyes of people but you are not released in the eyes of God he's in the hands of Pilate and Pilate hands him over to the authorities who all the time have been doing the will of their religious leaders who have been living into their spiritual insecurity and inferiority because they recognize the miraculous power that abides in the Messiah the master they never could manufacture for themselves can I tell you something every now and then you got to thank God for your enemies because they are an indication of the anointing and the assignment that God has placed in your life I'm glad somebody don't like me because it must mean that God is doing something on the inside of me watch this they put him into the hands of the people and now physically it's because of the hands of the soldiers that he finds himself with nails in his hand and a sword piercing his side and a crown of thorns placed upon his head he's been in their hands and they've been mocking and deriding him they've been bruising him with their fist and slashing his back with the whip it's all because of their hands but now at this last hour Jesus says enough is enough now I want to make a point right here real quick I want to clarify a theological axiom that Jesus was not killed and Jesus did not die Jesus made a decision that enough was enough and I'm taking myself out of their hands and putting myself in the only hands that can hold me the only hands that can keep me the only hands that is there anybody in this house that hears God saying you've lived long enough in the hands of people and it's time to put yourself in the hands of I want to speak a word of deliverance tonight uh, that it's time for somebody in this place uh, to take your life uh, out of the hands of people because uh, if you didn't know people are fickle and funny uh, they will be with you one second uh, and they'll turn against you the next uh, the very ones you helped out uh, will be the very ones that keep lies on you uh, oh god get yourself Can, can I speak a word to the preachers and say preachers we got to get ourselves out of the hands of the people because if you want to stand as a prophet of God that means sooner or later God's going to put a word in your mouth that's not going to be popular with the leadership it's easy to preach about the White House they don't tithe at your church it's easy to preach about the mayor he ain't a member of your church said you Massey but the truth is that if you want to speak truth to power it starts in your house you can't leave folk you scared of you gotta tell them thus says the Lord and if you don't like it there are exits available at every side of this touch somebody and tell them get your life out of their hands I'm talking to somebody with so, so much soul self esteem that you define your entire existence by the relationship that you're in you start talking crazy like I can't live without them the devil is a liar I done told my wife baby if I go before you go ahead cash in the insurance and buy whatever car you want now don't drive it to the funeral the folks go talk about you but I want you to go and get whatever you want as my last gift to you because my last word to you is that the sun will come out tomorrow you gonna have a life after me is there anybody in this house that understands that there's no individual that is so good to you that they can replace the God that has saved you redeemed you and blessed you
Cut some back and say, get your life out of there. I'm talking to somebody in the building today that's made the mistake of putting too much emphasis on the authority of some individual. I don't care who the judge is. I don't care how long the supervisor's been there. You got to make up your mind that either your destiny is in their hands or your destiny is in the hand of the one that brought you this far. Give your neighbor high five. And say, neighbor, don't worry about it. Promotion doesn't come from kissing up. Promotion doesn't come from apple polishing. But promotion comes from the Lord. I gotta go. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to push it this far. But I just got a revelation about what Good Friday really means. Good Friday means that after all Jesus had went through, there was one thing good about it. He didn't have to deal with petty people for another further. Father, 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 into thy hands. Command my spirit, and then the Bible says he gave up the ghost. He said, Father, first of all, because it was a psalm he was quoting. And if you're gonna get delivered and stay delivered, you need to have a word on the inside of you. Am I right about it? And I get a witness. Is there anybody here that can testify that you were all messed up in bondage? But you came to church and God spoke a word that shook off the shackles, opened up the prison door, and set your spirit free. Say yes. Say yes. Because not only did he say Father as a sound, but then secondly he said Father as a prayer. If you don't get delivered and stay delivered, you got to learn how to fall on your own two knees and cry out to your God. Is there anybody here that knows that some things you got to pray your way through? Well then thirdly and finally, because I'm out of time, not only did he say Father as a cry of psalm, not only did he say Father as a prayer of deliverance. But then thirdly he said, Father, as an act of praise, he's still hanging. He's still dying. But he's still referring to him as Father. And there's a little adjective I want to drop on you before I get to my seat. The Bible doesn't say he whispered it. The Bible doesn't say he murmured it. But the Bible says he cried with a loud voice. Father, now this will upset some folks huh? because I've learned when anybody praises God, huh? it upsets some people on the road. Huh? Just the other night, huh? we had an Easter play, huh? and I never get to sit out in the congregation. Huh? I was sitting out there, huh? but I wasn't sitting for long because huh? the spirit started moving, huh? and all of a sudden I could feel huh? the eyeballs of the individuals huh? sitting behind me. Huh? Like I wish he'd sit down. Huh? I wish he'd be quiet. Huh? You know it just don't take uh, all of that uh, and the more I could feel their eyes uh, the louder I got uh, because I took myself uh, out of the hands of people uh, and is there anybody uh, in this place uh, that's ready uh, to open up your mouth uh, and to cry loud uh, and spare not uh, I will uh, bless the Lord uh, say it say it Say yeah, say yeah, yeah. Oh, suck, this is my party. I'm going to shout if I want to. Grab one last hand and say, neighbor, feel my hand now. Because I'm about to take it out your hand. Lift up your hands, oh ye people. Is there anybody in this place that's ready to be delivered? Open up your mouth, put your hands together, and bless. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? I know he's all right. Yeah.
nobody moves and nobody get hurt. Nobody moving, everybody standing. We want to do what is necessary anytime the word of God comes forth. And that is to the extend the invitation that somebody might receive salvation tonight. That somebody might be rooted and planted in the house of God called church. And now we have uh, six churches represented here. All of these churches are Bible preaching, spirit filled churches, which means it's a good place for you to go. So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to tell you a story and I'll let you go. Woman lost a coin in the house. That's the whole story. You got it? Make sure you got it. Where was the coin lost? Where was the coin lost? That means you could be in the house and still be. So tonight, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, you're in the house, but you're still lost. If you're here, you're a Christian, but you don't have a church home, which means you're a homeless believer, that means you're lost. But the good news is you could be found right now. So on the count of three, here's what happens in the story. The Bible says because the corn is valuable, somebody shout, you're valuable. Because the corn was valuable, she started sweeping and searching until she found it. And when she found it, she brought her friends over to celebrate because that which was lost had been found. On the count of three, you're going to sweep your room. You're going to ask your neighbors those questions. Are you saved? Do you have a church home? If they say yes, say praise the Lord because you want to celebrate. If they say yes, I have a church home, say praise the Lord. If they say no, bring them down. I'm not sure. Bring them to the altar. I don't remember. Bring that brother and sister down because when God saves you, it's an experience you can't forget. Go ahead, sweep your, sweep your, sweep your role right now. Go and ask somebody, are you saved? Do you have a church home? Thank you for tuning in to our special online Good Friday service here at Kingdom Fellowship AME Church, where our senior pastor is Reverend Matthew Wadley. As you heard, he's a powerful preacher and he's got a word in his mouth and he's also an amazing teacher. But as he said in his closing remarks, he invited you and I to go ahead and turn to our neighbors and ask them if they're saved or if we have a church home. And if that's you, if you have yet to give your life to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, now is the perfect time. It doesn't always take a global catastrophe to realize that God is saying, hey, come unto me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you're tired of trying to figure it out on your own, trying to work your way through things and it's just not working out, now is the perfect time here on this Good Friday as we recognize this season that Jesus paid the ultimate price for all of the sins of all of mankind so we might be redeemed back into the family of God. Now is the perfect time to give your life to Jesus Christ. Won't you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, save me. I believe that Jesus died for my sins even as it says in Romans 10 and 9. I'm confessing with my mouth the Lord Jesus. Jesus, save me. I repent of my sins. Forgive me. Receive me into your family. With this prayer, Lord, I believe that I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to follow up with you. We have some of our counselors on the line right now. Some of our ministers are available to chat with you, to follow up with you, whether it be by email or phone. However you'd like to be contacted, we'd love to stay in touch with you to help you with this new walk of life. If you've yet to find yourself a church home, Kingdom Fellowship Amy Church is available for you. We're based in Silver Spring, Maryland, but we have reached all around the world, especially here through uh, global uh, technology that we have here online. We'd like to stay in touch with you. You can get more details on our website at kingdom.global, and one of our uh, representatives will contact you as soon as possible. And of course, since we're all shut in and shut down, it doesn't mean that we're shut out. We want to be able to connect with you as well around the things of God and help you to build up as you continue your walk with Jesus Christ. Again, I'm Minister Matt Anderson. Thank you so much for joining us here at Kingdom Fellowship AME Church, and we pray that you have a wonderful Good Friday and even better Resurrection Weekend. God bless you, Jesus loves you, and so do we. Jesus.